Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Algonquin College and welcome to tonight's virtual AC Wine Education event. My name is Marie-France Champagne. I'm the coordinator for the bartending program in the School of Hospitality, as well as the Sommelier program. Our program is one of the oldest and best recognized in the country. So we're happy to have you join us tonight. We're happy that you decided to kick off the winter semester with us. And before we get started, let's go through a few housekeeping items. So first of all, if you look at the bottom of your toolbar, we have live English uh, closed caption for tonight. So you can just press on that button. You will see a chat function. Please use that function to introduce yourself, tell us where you are, what wine do you like, tell us where in the country you are, where in the world you are. We have so many students studying internationally at the moment. So please use the chat function to introduce yourself. Next to the chat function, you will see a Q&A function. So as your wine expert for tonight goes through a presentation, please feel free to ask questions. And before we move on to the next topic, I will relay your questions to Andrea. This session tonight will be recorded and it will be posted on AC Day One uh, website by the end of this week. So before we get started, we have a special guest joining us tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce Algonquin College's CEO and President, Mr. Claude Brulé. President Brulé, over to you. Thank you very much, Marie-France, and good evening, everyone. As Marie-France said, my name is Claude Brulé, and I'm your president. I'm delighted to welcome you to your winter term. This is uh, our virtual way to connect with one another and uh, it may have already introduced myself to you. I've been part of the AC Day One series of activity all day today, starting with program orientations first thing this morning. So if I've already said hello to you, uh, welcome back again. And if this is the first time we meet, uh, welcome to Algonquin College. Uh, this semester will look a little bit different. As we know, uh, we're, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, we've been teaching and learning remotely uh, through tools like Zoom, as you're seeing right now. And uh, although, you know, we are going to have the opportunity in some cases to come to campus to meet face to face uh, to study some of our applied learning, most of it will be done in this fashion. And uh, the reason for that is we want to make sure that our number one priority continues to be the health and safety of our learners and our employees. And that's the reason why we've chosen to predominantly study and learn in this fashion. But I want to assure you that uh, your professors, uh, your course uh, professors, your program coordinators, the support staff, everyone uh, on the team is here to support you every step of the way. And for that, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for choosing Algonquin if this is your first time with us. And uh, thank you for returning to your studies if you're a returning student. You've chosen well, and uh, we hope you feel the, the pride that we do every day uh, when we're together. And uh, we want to look forward to uh, watching you unfold your journey as uh, uh, you continue to study with us. I've been with the college for over 21 years, and I can assure you that uh, it has been great to watch our students uh, become graduates and fulfill their hopes and dreams and uh, take their careers to the next level. Many of them have chosen to continue to live in the Ottawa region to uh, either further their studies or to work. I've seen people become employers in their own regard and uh, really become full participant in our economy. So I look forward to seeing how you will unf uh, unfold your journey by studying with us. So with that, I want to thank Marie-France and our sommelier uh, student, uh, Andrea Palmer, for hosting this fun wine education session this evening. So to all our learners, welcome to the AC family. And uh, if you have any questions, you wanna connect with your peers, um, just uh, follow the chat and ask your questions. So we're looking forward to uh, enjoying the rest of the evening with you. Thank you. Thank you, President, President Brulé. And you are correct. We never know where our journey uh, is going to take us. Many of our learners come back even to Algonquin College and 
have a second career with us. I am a proud graduate of our program myself. So now let's introduce uh, Andrea Palmer. So Andrea has almost completed our sommelier program. Uh, along the way has earned some uh, external certification that we offer that are internationally recognized. So Andrea is a WSET, that's the Wine and Spirit Education Trust graduate. So Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Mary France, and welcome everyone. I look forward to introducing you into the world of wine through our little webinar here today. Um, so as you may have seen on the AC Day One uh, little info website there, we have three wines that I will be welcoming you to taste this evening. Um, so we have the Henry of Pelham. You guys have the Old Vines, um, Baco Noir. We also have the Toro Bravo Tempranillo. And we have a Pinot Gris from the Cab de Turkheim winery. But before we get started with elements of tasting, I just want to introduce you guys to a little bit of the language that we use in the wine world, uh, something that was very new to me as a student coming into Algonquin. I just assumed that any flavor descriptor would be fine, but in the wine world, it's actually very important to be able to categorize the types of wines that you are drinking and to be able to describe them properly and describe how they make your mouth feel when you've got them in your mouth. It, it's very important so that we can categorize our wine. So to get started, some words that I'd like everyone to eliminate from their vocabulary forever when it comes to wine is sour, because that tends to have a negative connotation with a, a lot of wines. It, it doesn't really do justice to the process that makes the wine. So we prefer the term tart, mouth puckering, mouth watering, uh, zippy, refreshing, zesty, things that take on more of a fruit descriptor than as opposed to a, a negative descriptor. And same for when you're tasting red wines, we tend to stick to the bold and robust and stay away from tart or sour or anything like that. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. So some of the different styles of wine that we have here tonight, I tended to highlight on more common styles that you would see at dinner parties. I've noticed before the pandemic that the uh, Tempranillo, the Toro Bravo showed up a lot and it is a wonderful price point. So we're actually going to start tasting that today. Uh, start right now with that. And I'd like to invite everyone, if you have a piece of white paper anywhere near you to go ahead and grab that. Because one of the things that I like to note before I even put a glass to my nose is the color. So if you don't have it or you're near a white wall, that's the best you can do, that's the best you can do. Um, but I want to introduce you to some of the descriptors on the colors of wine, which tends to help give us clues as to what might actually be in the wine. So for the wine, the Toro Bravo Tempranillo, I'm gonna hold it up here. My camera's gonna play a little bit of a color trick because of the lighting here. But when I look at this wine and have it up against a white background, I notice that it is a medium garnet in coloring, which is characteristic for Tempranillo. But it also gives me a clue as to what types of flavors I'm going to possibly find in this. It's got a brighter color, so I know that it hasn't been aged forever. I do know that it will have blackberry and red fruit flavors inside of it. So I'm going to say after you've taken a look at it, just note down, note down what you notice about the coloring. Is it deep or is it light or is it medium? That is something that we tend to use as a descriptor. And so once you've got your descriptors down for the color, I'm going to invite you to just put your nose just above the glass. Step back and note down some of the the fruit and, and primary flavors that you smell there. So when we're hovering above the glass for our first sniff, my first sniff anyway, I tend to note that there are primary flavors of blackberry. There are some, some red fruits there, but also something a little deeper. And when I put my nose deeper into the glass for my second sniff, I notice that it opens up to a more robust white pepper 
flavor in there and I can I can get a little bit of black currant, a little bit of th that darker fruit, dark plum within that. And so I like to go down my checklist and I smell once, twice, a third time to note what I can smell in terms of primary flavors, fruit flavors that would typically be from the grape itself. Then I go back in for secondary aromas that might happen during the process of creating the wine, the vinification. And then I'm getting to the tertiary flavor, which is how the wine develops as it would have aged or sat in the bottle. So just note down some of the things that you smell that come up to you. Like I get white pepper. Some people tend to get a lot of blackberry and a little bit of spice. It's really different for everyone, but it's great to note down what you smell there. And once you've got your descriptors for the nose, we can move on to the palate. So I want everyone to give a bit of a swirl there. Smell again, remind yourself of what you caught on the nose and then take a sip. So if you would like to taste the wine, continue tasting it, move it around in your mouth. And right away, I get a burst of punchy fruit, black fruit, a little bit of that dark plum just seems to marinate there along with the blackberry and some red berries, a little bit of raspberry there as well, but also spice. So note down what you taste that first burst onto your palate because you're going to take another sip and we're going to see if we can de detect the tannin structure of this wonderful Tempranillo here. Go for your second sip. I move the wine around in my mouth and as it moves through my mouth, I'm going to give you guys another tip here. When we describe the tannin structure, because it can be anything from very light to rich and highly structured and, and strong. We tend to use similar flattering descriptors for tannins. I would categorize this as more chewy towards the front of my teeth. It does grip, it, it is grippy, but it is not an overly strong presence of tannin for me. And how you detect that is you move it around. And if you get a little bit, little bit of sticking in the front of your mouth, your teeth to your lip, I consider that to be a medium tannin. Right, so light would be, you can barely feel it. You can barely detect any of that grip in your mouth. And a super strong tannin, a robust tannin would be all through my mouth. I would, my tongue would be dry. I, I wouldn't even be able to really talk without moving my tongue across my teeth at that moment. So, so far we've already got our descriptors down. We've got our flavors down that we've noticed on our nose and also on the palate and we've moved on to the tannin structure. So I'm gonna invite you, if you're, not, uh, if you're not looking to drink a lot of wine tonight, I would grab a, a coffee mug to just, just eject a little bit. I, I've, I've graduated to the light sip club, so I'm going, to, I'm going to be just fine, but I invite anyone who would like to not imbibe too much to just grab a coffee mug and, and release it. But we're gonna go for an, another sip now because I want to describe to you, before you do that, I wanna describe to you what we're looking for in terms of acidity and how we describe that. Acidity affects your mouth in what I consider to be the sour candy, that sour candy memory that everyone gets when they were a small child, you know, eating sour candy with the sugar on top. If it's incredibly acidic, if it's high acidity, you're going to get a flood of saliva here in the mouth. It's going to start pooling in the back and work its way to the front. When I consider a wine to be low acidity, I will get some moistening on the tongue. You'll notice that maybe even a little under the tongue, you're not going to get a flood, an immediate flood, but medium to high acidity, you're going to feel kind of that prickling on the sides of your mouth towards the back of your mouth and a large flush of uh, saliva towards the front. So we're gonna take a sip and we're gonna see, I want everyone to note down for yourself, just so you know, um, whether you consider what you're about to taste to be a low, medium, or high acidity, and I'm gonna let you know what I think too. Ready? Here we go. Okay. 
I'm hoping everyone enjoyed that. I did. In terms of acidity, I find this to be on the medium to medium plus for acidity. acidity. It is not the highest acidity I've ever felt, but I did feel a little bit of pooling in my mouth. I didn't get that strong, harsh prickling that I would get from something a little younger and something with a little more red fruit present. But I did feel that rush of saliva there. So I want everyone to note down how, how taking that sip made your mouth feel in terms of how immediately just tart your tongue and the sides of your mouth were able to detect that and be able to just trigger that saliva. That for me is a good notation for acidity. And it, it does vary. Some people will notice that there's quite a bit there. They haven't had a lot of uh, tart fruit in the last little bit. They, they don't eat tart candy. But for most people, I would hope that you would pick up on that medium acidity and that it's not too strong. It's just right in that sweet spot. So we're gonna set the Tempranillo aside and if you guys want to update your notes and just take down what you're hearing and, and go back and take extra sips, I can't see you. It's fine. <laughs> uh, it's, we're going to move on in just a second to our next one, but I just wanted to give you guys a recap on what we were tasting. This is a Tempranillo Merlot. This is a blend. And so what typically happens with blends is that it it's done so that the wine can have a smoother and fuller flavor and a taste as well. And one of the things I like about Merlot is that this particular grape, despite the bad press it got in the 90s, is just a wonderful, very smooth, wonderful grape. You make a wine blend with it and it is incredibly smooth. And I think that's why they chose it to blend with the Tempranillo there. Okay, so if you see this on a lot of tables coming out of the pandemic, it's because people tend to gravitate a lot towards that smooth taste, that bold, that red wine taste that's got just a smoothness, not too much tannin, not too much acidity, just right on the balance. Uh, so that is a recommendation that I would give to everyone if you are looking for something that's a good introduction to a red wine. So we're going to- Andrea, what is the price point for this wine? This wine is $8.95, which is an incredible deal for what you are tasting. So the beauty, as we uh, learn more about wine, is that a lot of people start spending less on wine as they learn more about it and finding some incredible value like, like this wine here. Do we have any questions for Andrea on the Toro Tempranillo Merlot? We have a question. What is the blend? The blend, we have the Tempranillo Merlot, but it doesn't have the exact breakdown of the percentages here, but typically it does tend to vary. So Merlot tends to be on the lower end. This tastes to me, just to me as a majority Tempranillo with a hint, a hint of Merlot to keep that smoothness because that is something that typically makes a, a wine style that most are not familiar with a, a bit more approachable. And for everybody's information, um, usually when you have a blend, the grape that's gonna be first on the bottle, so in this case, Tempranillo, first grape on the label, and then the, the other one will be the supplementary grape. Right, Andrea? That's right. Wine. Next wine. So we are moving forward. We have the Henry of Pelham Baco Noir Old Vines. So this wine, you'll notice right away, the color is much deeper than the Tempranillo Merlot that you were just drinking. So if you do want to hold it up to the white background and take a look at it. And again, my, my wall might play a few tricks on you guys here. But I also like to look, I put my finger on the bottom of the glass if I've got a white table or just a white paper and I look through to check out the clarity as well. And so I would consider this to be a medium ruby because I can still see my finger when I tilt it here. So when you are looking at your wine, when you are moving it about the glass as well. You'll notice for a few wines when you swirl it before you taste it, 
you'll notice a thickness coming down the glass, the tears coming down the glass. They call those the legs of the wine. If you are into analyzing a few different things about wine, I tend to look for how slow the legs run down the glass as an indicator, possibly an indicator for alcohol and, and sugar in the wines. Um, and that's something that I just keep in my head when I'm going to make my notes to see if I'm right. So I notice thick legs along my glass here, but they are moving not too quickly. They're moving a bit slowly down the glass. So when I'm looking at the alcohol content of a wine, this one is 13%. By the way, the Tempranillo Merlot is also 13%. Um, I tend to just watch how that thickness plays in uh, for me, for the alcohol. So we're going to take our sniff of the Baco Noir. I, this is one of my favorite grapes, so I do hope that you enjoy it. So we're going to hover our nose just above the rim of the glass. We're going to go for our first sniff of the primary flavors that we're going to pick up on our nose. So we're going to note those down. For some of you, you might pick up immediately on just the blackberry, a little hint of raisin. The old vines tends to have a more rich character um, than a typical, than a Baco Noir that you might find, a Sleeping Giant, that kind of, you know, just an old vine has a richer flavor profile. They've been around a lot longer than what you would typically find. And so you put your nose back to the glass again. And we've got our secondary flavors. Some things that I might note is that there is a little bit of white pepper again and that richness of plum and a little raisin, a little smoke. There's something almost jammy about the flavor that I'm picking up when I go back in. So I always note down what type of fruit and, and the conditions of the fruit. Is, is it old fruit? Is it young fruit? Am I smelling a young raspberry? Am I smelling a jammy raspberry, jammy blackberry, black currant? I'm smelling very jammy black currant with this one. So once you note down your flavors on the nose, we're going to just keep those in mind because we're going to go for our first sip. We're going to move the wine around in our mouth again, and we're going to try and see what flavors we pick up right away. And we're also going to see how our mouth feels as well, because I want you guys to be looking for that rush of saliva if it's going to be highly acidic or if you feel that it is lightly acidic. So we're gonna go for our sip now. So right away, and we'll get to the fruit flavors, but I wanna get to this while it's fresh in my mind. Right away, I get a very healthy rush. My mouth is just really loving that acidity there, but it is well integrated and well balanced. I would say that this is a medium plus acidity that's well integrated and it does help play up the characteristic of the fruit. So I noticed that there is a tart blackberry, there's flat currant, there's a hint of rosiness that I can actually taste. There's smoke, there's white pepper, there's dark plum, there's a bit of red plum. There's just a very, very strong richness and robustness to this wine. When I you don't like it at all, eh, Andrea? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I should probably just get into selling this because I have recommended it so much. And you guys can tell um, yourselves if there is a favorite wine of the night, you will notice that you will come up with a dozen different descriptors. But yes, Mary France is correct. I think she was there the very first time I tasted this, by the way, in her grape varieties class. This grape is for me just beautiful. But yes, for those of you who are waiting for me to get to the next part of this lesson with this wine. We're going to take another healthy sip, everyone. I want you guys to pay attention. You're going to move the wine to the front of your mouth, but also to each side. And then you're going to either swallow or spit. And I want you to pay attention to how the inside skin of your mouth feels against your teeth, but also I want you to pay attention to your tongue and whether it feels dry or whether you can still move it around and it's not tight there. Ready? We're going to go. I enjoy that very much. 
I also want to tell you that a good example of well integrated tannins. This wine here. So if you are recommending a wine, I want to just touch on this really quick because I know that some people when they say that they don't like a particular wine, I don't, I don't like red wine because of the tannins and they might very well be talking about the acidity, but they could also be talking about uh, that, that abrasive dryness that they occasionally get this, this wine I consider to be medium tannin. It is well integrated. It is, it is not going to dry the mouth out. It's not going to have a burn that goes all the way through your mouth. It is robust in flavor, but it is what I consider to be finely integrated tannins. So if you find someone that says, I don't like bold reds because the tannins just get to me, I, this is a wine that I would suggest for them as well as the Toro Bravo, but also a very good option. So for everyone there who is starting to notice a key difference between the two red wines that we have tasted, you'll note that for the Toro Bravo, and I'll lift it up here, the clarity of this wine, where you can put your finger to the bottom of the glass, look right through it, you, you've got a, a garnet hue to the wine, whereas with the other wine, it's a little bit more ruby purple and more deep in coloring, and you can't see your finger as well through it. You'll notice that there was a younger flavor profile to the Tempranillo Mer Merlot, even though it had very smooth, dark grapes that featured just like the Baco Noir. And that's something that is very, that I love to highlight and bring up in wines because just because a wine is red doesn't mean that it's going to be punchy and tart like a red fruit. It could be deep with cooked fruit flavors inside of it. So that's just something to keep in mind that they can be very, they can both be red, but they have very different flavor profiles. So if you are keeping your notes, make sure you notate the differences between these wines and, and you can look at which one you like better, which will give you a clue as to the style that you gravitate toward. But I'm going to move you also, before we move into the white wine, I just want to give everyone an opportunity to ask any questions on structure. Is there anything that you feel might be a little bit confusing for you in terms of structure? Do you have any questions on tannins or their makeup or anything like that? Because I do want to eventually get to those questions as well. <laughs> So we do have a few questions. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I have one before. How would you describe the body of a wine? Because people always talk about light body and full body, and you kind of touched on that now with those two wines. So how would you describe the body of a wine? That's excellent. That is an excellent way to go about it. So we tend to look for a light, medium, bold, robust, um, full-bodied. Those are the, the words that we use, but when you think of a light wine, I typically don't consider with a red wine um, any any old vine, any any incredibly dark, rich, jammy fruit red wine to be a, a light body unless we're talking about a gamay. So a style that I would consider to be light, if you're looking at a red wine for light, would be a gamay or even a, a Pinot Noir Rosé that would fall into the light category for me. But when you think about the mouthfeel of a light wine, it tends to feel tart, like that, that descriptor we use, but it also, it gives you, a, when you taste the wine, you taste the youth of the fruit that is there and the conditions of the fruit that is there. I would describe a light red wine as a young red fruit gaming or a, a young blackberry with and you can add any any other descriptors like floral, herbaceous, and that kind of thing. But I definitely look at how it makes my mouth feel and if there's a healthy acidity to the wine as well, because that contributes to the light body. You wouldn't say that something that had uh, low acidity and very, very low tannin and, and a more sweet flavor would err on the lighter side, right? Because that would be cloying. And as for medium body, I would actually say that the Tempranillo Merlot would err on the medium plus side for me. And I would say medium plus to full for our old vines Baco Noir. And the reason for that is because I get a much more rich fruit flavor in the Baco Noir. 
I find that the cooked fruit flavors tend to add a weight, add a weight to the wine, which is something that I think might sound confusing. But when I think of weight in terms of alcohol, if a, a wine has a higher alcohol and a good tannin structure and great acidity, balanced medium acidity, that would be the medium plus to, to full body to me because alcohol has weight. If that's, I hope that didn't confuse everyone. <laughs> It was very clear. Do you remember the analogy we used to uh, use in class about milk and body and wine, right? So light body wine is more like a skim milk and a full bodied wine is more like a whole milk. Oh. So it's kind of like that perception in your mouth. We have some really good questions in the Q&A. You ready? Okay. Yes. How can I know if a wine is good if I've never bought it before? So if I'm in the liquor store, and I want to buy a good wine and I can't taste it, what are the key points you would be looking for? Something that I would look for and, and, and did on the recommendation of my wonderful professors is as opposed to looking high shelf or low shelf or anything like that, I do look up the producer. I do feel that in the age of smartphones you do want to take a look at the producer of the wine but also I like to look at the <laughs> this is going to sound interesting but I like to look at the residual sugar in a wine and the alcohol content in a, in a wine as a, uh, a a young lady who was of legal drinking age I knew that my flavor palette my palate was conditioned towards wine that was on the sweeter side but also I didn't know how to describe tannin structure or acidity. So I looked for the alcohol. So if you are someone who favors red fruit, you enjoy red fruit, you also know that you don't typically enjoy too much sugar. You don't enjoy candy or, or sweet things. I would look toward a lighter style of red wine. I would look at the alcohol content of the wine. If you are purchasing a red wine that has very high alcohol and high residual sugar, odds are you're going to be enjoying a blend, <laughs> a sugary blend, and you might not enjoy that too much. So I would say if you enjoy fruit, fruit and sweetness and those things, I you can look at a blend, you can check the alcohol. I tend to stay between 13 to 14. That was when I was a new drinker myself. But I also think that if you are someone who gravitates toward previous styles, like if you're a Pinot Grigio fan, but you want to look at a Chardonnay, how do you know what a good Chardonnay would be? Well, you enjoyed a lighter style of wine, you would look for an unoaked Chardonnay. Then typically those who don't like Chardonnay don't like the oak in it. And that is whatever you drank before tends to be a flavor profile that you would look for again. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Oh. So, question, how much the glass should be filled for different drinks? Different drinks. Uh, so you mean like liquor versus beer or just different styles? Uh, so let's go with wine. So I have my little wine glass here and I do have a real wine glass that I'm gonna have after here. Yes. So what should they be filled up to? For tastings, I tend to favor three ounces. Okay. If you are, if you are in a restaurant, for example, our uh, Algonquin College restaurant, we have either the three, the six, or the nine ounce pour. Um, I think that for a... <laughs> So that would be too much, right? That would, that would be too much, yes. So your three ounce, um, I'm trying to touch the screen, but yes, there you go, right there. Um, so I would recommend a, a three ounce pour for, especially for liqueurs, um, fortified wines, especially, you wanna keep the serving size rather small. Obviously for sparkling, I say fill her up. I, I don't think there is a limit uh, when it comes to sparkling. And then for your reds, your typical reds and whites, um, anywhere between three and six, I think is perfectly fine. But for fortified wines, I tend to keep keep it low. I don't think anyone needs uh, nine ounces of Tokai. Um, <laughs> and not, not right now. <laughs> we have another question. Good evening. Is a low acidity sign of a good wine? 
Also, when I, when I taste red wines, I often notice the dryness in my mouth. Is that normal? And the last wine I've tasted is a Pinot Noir. I like your taste in wine. So I'll go through your first question. Uh, acidity may or may not be the sign of a, a, a trueness to the style. I wouldn't say that there's a good or a bad wine in terms of acidity. I think that you will note the difference in a quote unquote flabby wine occasionally a wine will lack acidity even though it has sweetness and quite a bit of body and so we call that flabby because it doesn't have the structure of acidity to lift it up and, and give it that balance something like a, a chardonnay i'm picking on chardonnay i don't know why i love it i promise i love it but an oak chardonnay that doesn't have enough acidity to lift up the structure would be described as flabby and if it has a bit too much sweetness without that acidity to cut through it then know that in, in my opinion, I wouldn't gravitate towards that. However, however, uh, a low acidity red, like, like a Merlot, I don't consider that flabby. I consider that a sign of a, a beautifully tempered Merlot wine, as long as it has acidity and as long as it, is, it hasn't been uh, chaptalized or, or overly sweetened, then that would be an indicator of a great wine. So really acidity is depending on the great variety that was vinificated benef for your wine. And also, <laughs> you notice a dryness in your mouth when tasting red wine. That is very normal. That is your mouth picking up on the tannin structure. I encourage you to drink more red wine so that you can, you can decipher between the different types of dryness that you feel and where in your mouth the dryness occurs first. For me, sometimes it occurs in the teeth, sometimes on the tongue, depending on the style. It's very normal. You have no reason to be worried at all. Drink more wine. And also, you like Pinot Noir. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Keep drinking. <laughs> All right, we have no more questions. So I think we're ready for wine number three. Wine number three is fantastic. Okay, it's a very large bottle, a gorgeous bottle. This is a Pinot Gris of Alsace. And right away, I just want to highlight this bottle because it is gorgeous, but also the uh, bottles that we have that wines come in, um, you'll notice that there is a difference in between each wine that you have and the style of bottle. So that to me is a great way for me to discern even from far away before I even look at labels, uh, what wine I'm tasting. Riesling has a structured bottle, um, Alsatian Pinot Gris, your Pinot Noirs, your Baco Noirs tend to come in the stubbier bottles with the long necks. And so I encourage you to take a look at the types of bottles and notice that there is a repeating pattern when you look at certain styles. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and have our Cab de Turkheim Pinot Gris. And I just want you to take a look at your glass because you'll notice a little bit diff it's a little bit different than with your red wines. You can see the clarity is very clear through this, but I want you to take a look at the tint of the wine here. So when we described the red wines, we used words like garnet and ruby or purple for those of you who may have decided that it looked more purple. But when you hold it up, I've got light coming through so you might not see as well in mine. But when I hold this up here, I noticed that it has a deeper, you might call it yellow, but we tend to use lemon, gold, those, those color descriptors. And so I see a medium lemon coloring here on mine, just with my light, and it's very clear. But you'll also notice, unlike the red wines, you can see a bit of bubbles on the bottom of the glass there. It's not effervescent, it's not coming up through the glass, coming up to the surface, but it is present. There is bubbles, bubbles there in the glass, um, but it's completely clear you'll note. So I'm going to have you just note that down and lean your nose just above the rim. Give it a sniff and note down what you smell and then bring your nose back deeper into the glass and see what you pick up. And you can go ahead and give it a swirl if you like, just to mix up the wine. And this is one of my favorite styles as well, because you can pick up with this white wine, unlike with say, I don't want to go back to Chardonnay. So I'll say with a, a, with a Riesling, for example, uh, depending on where it's produced, you might pick up diesel note or something outside of the fruit and vegetable family. With this, I pick up mineral chalk and herbaceous 
and apple and lemon, uh, a little bit of white peach as well. And so this is just a very, very, very light fruit, light fruit flavor profile with a little bit of something outside of it. So I pick, you pick up your mineral, you pick up an herbaceous profile in this wine, which is not typical of what you just had with the red wines. So I'm gonna invite you to take a taste now and we're not gonna be looking for tannin because you typically don't have it in most of the white wines that you will taste but there are some, but we'll get into that later, but just go ahead and take a taste of this wine. So as you move it through your mouth here, you'll notice that you do pick up a tartness in the back. It's moving through the back of your mouth towards the front. You're picking up tart fruit flavor of apple, green apple, that's what I found there. A touch of that mineral taste, that kind of chalky mineral, just as an allusion to the soil that it was likely grown in, but also that kind of lime, grapefruit, and white peach flavor as well that added to the tartness. None of the white fruits that are in this wine are heavy or bruised. They're very young and, and they're fresh, but there is a hint of sweetness just as it was leaving, just as the flavor was leaving. So I want you guys to take note of that because that sweetness, a part of the style of Pinot Gris is that it can be dry, but it can also take on a bit of an off dry taste. And what you have here is an off dry, slightly off dry, veering towards off dry <laughs> Pinot Gris. And that is a very, very gentle flavor. It might not be the same as the Pinot Grigio that you might be used to. This is this is another way to create, to uh, vinify that grape. And you'll notice it typically in the Alsatian style, in an Alsatian Pinot Gris, they, they can be a bit off dry. So I want you to go in for your second taste because we are gonna focus more on the acidity. I know we got the fruit flavors there on that first sip, but go back again one more time. And as you move it around, you do notice that, yes, you did get a little bit of that brush of saliva in your mouth, but it wasn't jarring, at least I hope not. And what that sweetness did was help balance the acidity because there, there is a bit of acidity there, but that sweetness was, help, was to help smooth it out. So as the wine is leaving, the taste is leaving, you might've picked up on a little bit of, just a little bit of warmth as well. So the alcohol is well integrated in there as well. This wine I believe is 13, yes, 13% 13 alcohol. And so sometimes the heat of alcohol can get to you if you don't have a little bit of that sweetness to balance it, because again, the alcohol does that sweetness, but you want the flavor profile to have that as well. And also a bit of healthy acidity. I consider this to be medium minus acidity for me because of how well integrated it is. There is a rush of saliva there, but it is not overpowering. It is well balanced. So go ahead and note that down if you are keeping notes here. Did anyone have any questions on the Pinot Gris style? Because I can't actually see the Q&A, so I have to rely on people to tell me. Um, just want to check in really quickly before I move forward. No questions yet. No questions yet. Okay. Um, my favorite, favorite part of enjoying wine is pairing, and I didn't really touch on it on anything because I wanted to get everyone tasting. And hopefully you've been noting the fruit flavors and the flavor profiles you pick up. So for our first wine that we tasted, the Toro Bravo, I noted that I did see it at a lot of dinner parties prior to the pandemic, but I've also been utilizing it myself. I find that I tend to move toward this when I serve braised steak, when I serve any kind of bolognese, I find that the lighter compared to the Bacchus Noir, the lighter fruit flavors and the smoothness go wonderful with tomato-based sauces. I think it's just an incredible pairing, but also because of how smooth it is, the, the Tempranillo Merlot, the Toro Bravo, you can also enjoy a nice healthy six ounce glass if you feel so inclined uh, on its own, because I believe that the tannin and acidity structure do complement just drinking it on its own. So typically with red wines, they recommend you pair with red meats. And typically with white wines, they recommend you pair with fish and 
vegetables and, and, and white sauce pasta. And for the most part, I, I do think there is something to that rule. However, one of the great things about wine is that it does have complexity. It's not just one linear flavor. So just as I would use a tomato-based sauce with the Tempranillo Merlot for the Baco Noir, I would tend towards something a little more daring. I would tend towards either a burger or even a, just a nice rich sausage and potato casserole. I would do sausage pasta. I would any kind of um, meat with a mixture of spices with fennel, just really rich, rich meats that aren't necessarily on the lighter side. Like I would love a lamb with the Baco Noir as well. I think that would go just gorgeously with that. And then you have your white wine, this here. I do think this is wonderful for sipping on its own, but in terms of pairing, I find that the effervescence, the, the tartness and that, that zippiness that is balanced with the sweetness goes great with seafood and white, white sauce pasta. I think you can't go wrong with that, but I also think that it also pairs well if you have a vegetarian or a uh, vegan diet, you can also do a mushroom casserole with this. You can, it's very, very versatile, I think, because of the fact that you do have those mineral and herbaceous flavors mixed in with the green apple and the lime and the white grapefruit and the white peach. This is a very, very versatile white that I, I do enjoy serving and recommending. Uh, another favorite, I guess you could say, even though I technically don't have favorites. <laughs> I can see Mary Franz smiling because it's she, like children, right? We're not supposed to have a favorite. You don't have a favorite. <laughs> Love them all. Different way. Uh, as we wait for uh, questions to come in, for those of you interested in tasting some uh, very good wine that are not too expensive, if you go to the program's Twitter page, so that is at AC Psalm. And if you scroll through the photos, you will see some uh, photos of little dinner cards that we have had at a restaurant. And we run a wine dinner series at the restaurant when the restaurant is open. And a very successful wine dinner series. And the, the sold out event is always the LCDO hidden gems. So we usually pour eight to 10 wines that are under $15 from the LCBO. So you can see a few of those on our Twitter feed uh, at AC Sum. So let's see if we've got some more questions for Andrea. Andrea, do you wanna share what your Instagram is for your followers? Yes, so the Instagram is at palm, like the palm of your hand, Som, S-O-M-M, -M, wine, W-I-N-E, palm some wine, and it's on Instagram. There you go. It's in the, I see it in the chat there. And so when this is over, I have my text to speech up and running. So I'll be doing the bullet points from our Instagram meeting and I'll be re-answering some of the questions that uh, I thought were pretty great. And I'll also be showing the bottles and putting up the prices there as well for the bottles. Uh, for those who um, aren't going to be online right this second, the Cab de Turquin, the Pinot Gris is 21.95 and your Baco Noir Old Vines is 19.95. So the price points for these wines with the taste, I mean, honestly, you can't beat it. I don't think we had one bad wine tonight, but I am a little biased. You know, once we start uh, studying wine, then we just want more and more and more, right? More and more and more. It's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> but it's beautiful because it's fascinating and it's forever changing and evolving, right? All right, do we have more questions for Andrea? You explained it so well. We yes. have <laughs> Oh, my have a minute with this wine. <laughs> so which one is your favorite of the three, Andrea, tonight? The Baco Noir, but I think, I think I may have given that away. I'm so sorry, everyone. It's not that it's better than anything else. Again, we don't have any favorites of merit. We just have, uh, in terms of style, I enjoy, I enjoy that style very much. Yes. Okay. All right. 
So if we don't have any more questions, I would like to uh, thank the AC events team for having done a great job today and organizing all of these lovely events for our students on AC day one. Oh, I can't have any curious for that. Ah, we have one more question. And I believe it comes from our event support group. Can you discuss stemless versus stem wine glass? Yes, I have, I have, I own both stemless and stemmed wine glasses. And you'll notice that throughout this entire thing that I'm holding my glass by the stem, um, just a habit that I naturally have. But I find that in terms of serving wines, because stemmed wine glasses come in specific styles, like you'll notice Mary France had um, a more angular, a wine glass with a more angular bottom and a, a narrower top, so a Pinot glass. And then a traditional wine glass um, that we use. In terms of tasting, we tend to steer towards these glasses, the, the more narrow rim with a, a full bowl, and that the styles of wine glasses are done so that we can smell and taste appropriately. We wanna get the aromas funneling up properly. And that's why you have the original style of stemmed glasses. Um, I do feel that you, as a, a, a casual drinker, someone who's serving wine at a party, there is really not much difference, um, I feel, in terms of how your wine quality is with a stemless glass, if you're enjoying casually. I do think that if you are looking to enhance uh, the taste and smell of wines that you would go for a Pinot glass or Pinot, you would go for, um, I know they're moving away from fluted wine glasses for champagne towards the more bulb tulip style. And that's to keep the effervescence of the champagne uh, true to character. We may have lost Mary France, but that's okay. I can keep going. Um, it, it, so if you were asking about the merits of stemless versus stemmed, unless you are um, testing a varietal, tasting a varietal and trying to get the true character of a varietal, uh, the styled wine glasses with stems would be your best bet. Otherwise, if you're drinking casually, stemless is fine. <laughs> Very good, glad to help. Okay, I think we have lost Mary France for sure, but but it's a good thing we got through the majority of our session. I still want to thank everyone for joining today. And I hope you have learned something. And I hope you visit the Instagram page because I will be making regular updates and providing not only the wines for tonight, but I do recommendations quite regularly. And uh, it's very nice to see you, Quad. Hello. <laughs> and Oh, there we are. There we are in the chat. Anyone wants to rewatch? You can go to the Algonquin College Orientation AC Day One. Thank you all. <laughs>